and uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, Mike, I'd like to kick off right from the beginning and, and um, inquire about your route into, into the arts uh, and to your uh, professional background. Yes, that's a great starting point. By the way, listening to that long catalogue of stuff <laughs> I've done, it didn't sort of really sound like me. I think it just confirms that I'm very old. That's what I, I get out of that long catalogue. Um, I got into the arts in education almost by accident, dare I say. It's, uh, <clears throat> I enrolled many, many, many years ago for a PGC in English, actually, at Durham University. And happened to notice a sign that said optional drama course. And I just went along fairly casually and was absolutely gripped, engaged, fired up. It was a, a, quite an impact on me. Um, how shall I put this politely? My undergraduate years, I wasn't particularly enamoured of them. You know, teaching wasn't very um, sophisticated at that time. But the experience of the PGC really fired me up. And the interesting thing, looking back, was that engaging with drama affected my attitude to all aspects of the PGCE and I really engaged with everything. And then I carried on with diploma. I was so interested in drama, particularly drama in the context of education, that I went on to, you know, an advanced diploma, an MA, a PA. I became a sort of permanent student as well as a um, teacher in secondary schools before I went into higher education. Excellent, thank you. Um, so you have chosen to focus this evening's conversation on one of your recent papers. Could you give us um, uh, uh, some details about the context of the paper? Yes, this um, paper I was asked to do, I was invited to do a paper for a special edition of a journal. And the actual focus of the paper is arts language and intercultural education, sort of those three aspects. And for this particular conversation, I did wonder if that was a bit of a narrow focus for our conversation, but actually what they had asked me to do was to address some broad issues in the arts. And I'm hoping that by just focusing on aspects of that paper, um, it will be of, of, of interest to our, to our audience. Um, I focused it around different questions and I thought it might be, you know, helpful to structure our talk if we uh, addressed one or two of the questions that I, I posed in the paper. And also, an advantage of focusing on the paper is that the paper can be available for people. I mean, it's not published yet, but the draft is pretty finished and ready. So hopefully that would allow us to not worry about too many writers, authors, specific detail, but keep things fairly general. That sounds like an excellent plan. Um, uh, and we will give details for those who wish to have uh, the paper sent to you uh, at the end of uh, tonight's event. Um, you opened the paper with the question, are the claims for the arts overstated? So could you tell us uh, what made you start with that question and the conclusion you came to? Well, hearing you, you know, mention the question like that, it does sound a little negative, as if I'm trying to say, to reduce, suggests that the arts don't have as much impact as we, we claim for them. Um, that's not my intention. I know the question sounds a little bit provocative and it, it is meant to be, um, but I was looking through the internet, looking at the internet as we, we do. Um, what would we do as researchers without, without the internet? And I noticed this, I need to read here. <clears throat> that the arts can improve problem solving, resilience, well-being, teamwork, confidence, school attendance, emotional intelligence, success in life, performance and academic subjects, and so on and so on. 
Another website says dance will improve student test scores, lower dropout rates, improve learning in other subjects, foster teacher and student morale, and support the learning of underserved populations. And the way I read that, I suppose it sounds if I'm saying they're quite mighty claims, but it's not my intention to say that the arts don't have a very strong <clears throat> impact. I mean, I'm a case in point, all those years ago on PGC, the arts had a, a, a big impact on me. I suppose the question I'm asking though, is whether such a broad generalization is always helpful, is maybe dangerous, maybe dangerous is the wrong word. Is, is there the possibility that both our thinking and our practice maybe gets limited by kind of universal claims of that kind? Because faced by claims like that, I think it's perfectly legitimate to ask questions like, well, is this true of every single art form, art subject? Is it true at all ages? Is it true in all contexts, in compulsory schooling, in arts in the community? And so, is it true of creating and responding to, to art so that we can start asking questions which perhaps um, leads us to say, to what degree do we adapt our teaching according to the claims that are being made? And by teaching, I think teaching in the arts is very, very diverse. It can mean demonstrating, engaging people, uh, questioning, pointing out one thing rather than another, and so on and so on. It's very, very diverse. But I suppose the question um, I want to ask is, should we think more about the claims we're making in relation to the teaching? If I take an example, if we emphasize problem solving, resilience or teamwork, to take a few examples from the list, is this reflected in our approach? Or is the claim that any experience of art meets these claims? Um, I know you don't want to get too bogged down in, in too many references to the literature uh, in this conversation, but I know that there is a particular writer which uh, you mention in your paper, which you uh, wanted to refer to in relation to this theme of overgeneralization. Yes, yes. I, I rarely write anything without mention Wittgenstein. And Wittgenstein, I think, isn't as fashionable as he used to. A lot of other theorists have sort of taken over and are, fashionable isn't perhaps the right word. But he uses a great phrase, I think, in one of the, his bits of writing. He talks about a human craving for generality. And I really like that phrase because we all know about cravings. <laughs> I know I certainly do. Um, craving for generality is an interesting phrase because it suggests to me that there's something good and necessary that we can go too far with. So I think he would say that, of course, generalizing is absolutely essential. Without the ability to generalize, we wouldn't be able to understand communicate, use language, and so on. But he's saying the craving to take the generalization a bit too far, possibly in the in the assumptions we make about language and, and meaning. We all use the words like art, creativity, and imagination. And because we can communicate, we assume that those words mean the same thing, but they, but they don't. We can still communicate with the words having different shades of meaning or family resemblance, as, as, as he says. So I think that the, the, the warning about generality has to do partly with formulating theories as well. And this is where it's very helpful. It looks like I've sort of gone away from the arts a bit, but actually art theories is something his thinking about generalization has a lot to help us with, I would say. 
Yeah, and just picking up on that point, can you give us um, some examples of the kind of art theories that you mean? Yes, and, you know, I realise this bit will be a little condensed, maybe too brief, uh, but I'll mention um, a few. And what these theories sort of historically were doing was tr trying to say definitively what art is and how we account for art. So the theory of significant form, for example, um, that actually has its origins way back in the 18th century, but it manifested itself, you know, more recently, that form is the defining characteristic of art. Um, for, by form, you know, colour, shape, rhythm, and so on. But that was the key. And, that theory was rejected because it was thought to be too, it separated art out too much from the hurly burly of life. It was just contemplation of form um, and aesthetic beauty. So we have expression theories coming along. The art is all about emotion. And I think they still are quite, you know, strong in an education context. You know, an artist is expressing an emotion in a work that the audience will respond to and so on, the self-expression theory. Then there are other versions of the expression theory. They got criticised because they placed too much emphasis on inner aspects of people as explanations of art. We have aesthetic attitude theories that place more emphasis on the percipient or the audience saying it's a special kind of characteristic. I told you this would get a bit dense, didn't I? But caught condensed, not dense, I hope. Uh, we've also got representation theories and institutional theories and so on. Now, the intricacies of those theories isn't that uh, important, I think, although if people wanted to read more you know, there's more about them in the paper, more references. The key interesting thing is that we could say that every one of those theories is wrong. Not because there's another theory that replaces it that's better, because it is a theory with a capital A and a capital T. That's very much a Wittgenstein. It's an attempt at overgeneralization. It's a an attempt to say for once and for all to put boundaries around of art and say this is what art is this is it defined very precisely and that um we don't have to do that to be able to use art as a concept to talk about art and engage with art we don't have to come to a definitive explanation um so it's not uh a problem in theorizing, I should say. It's not anti-theory, but it's trying to form narrow, restrictive boundaries to form definitions. Okay. I, I just want to very briefly pick up um, uh, about one of the, the, the themes in, in what you have just presented there, um, and it's the contrast between technique and emotion, because I think for, from a dance perspective, where there are dance techniques, but dance also being a creative form, um, which demonstrates emotion or, or provokes an emotive response, either from the performer or the observer, I'm just really uh, want to sort of uh, how that, that, how you see that might relate to dance as a that's, performance art. That, that's, in, that's actually really, really helpful because um, the thing about the theoretical, the, the theories that are trying to be explanations, we don't have to turn our back on them, I think. We can actually look at them and say, how is this helpful, this theory? So the theory of form is a reminder that form and technique are important and probably dance, people who engage in dance don't need a reminder of that because that is so important in the subject. But literature teachers, for example, who turned literature lessons into a form of sort of social studies where we bounce away from the, 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 the literature to talk about the themes and 
go further and further away from the text, perhaps needed a reminder of the importance of, of form. As aesthetic attitude theories um, are a reminder of the importance of responding as well as creating art. So all these theories can help us if we're liberated from trying to pick the right one, we can say, oh, they're all have some usefulness. So that the expression theory, balancing expression and uh, technique are central to a lot of arts, including mm -hmm. dance. Um, and so the theories help us see the significance of balance. I think that would be the point. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So uh, your second question in the paper asks whether the use of the arts in, in the service of non-art <clears throat> outcomes runs the risk of um, distorting the art form itself. Um, so does that question relate to the theories of art that you've just outlined? Yes, they, I would say they do. Um, I think we're all familiar with the notion of art for art's sake which comes out of, I would say, the formless theories um, I, I, I mentioned, which in turn comes out of 18th century theories focusing on beauty and aesthetics and so on. Um, in education, we have the notions of, in writing about education, learning in and learning through in relation to arts. You know, people might be familiar with those, uh, that contrast. Learning in the art, learning about the art form itself, learning through more external extrinsic aims, all sorts of things I read out before about the claims for the arts and so on. Um, I think the arts for art's sake isn't as, People is not convinced by it, the contemporary theorists, I, I would say, because it seems too um, old fashioned. It's separatist. It argues that the art should be removed from political and social and moral concerns, which doesn't ring true with the contemporary world. You know, we, we take a more inclusive approach to arts as opposed to what might be called separatist. But if we put on, that view that says, let's not subscribe to the kind of overgeneralization. Let's not try and pick which theory is an improvement on the last theory, but say, how can these help? I would want to say that um, art for art's sake doesn't have to be rejected in its entirety. Yeah, it, it sounds to me uh, that you're you're sort of suggesting that there should be some place in contemporary thinking uh, for the uh, arts for uh, art's sake views. Would that be a, a correct interpretation? It would be a correct interpretation, and um, <clears throat> immediately people might say, by saying that, you're rejecting the more inclusive view. And I think the whole point about the overgeneralizing, which is a theme that will run right, right through this, the whole point about the overgeneralizing was we're not forced to choose. We can look at the art for art's sake, the fairly traditional view and say, what is useful in this? I think one thing, and I've mentioned this already, is reminding us of the importance of form. And I think in some subjects, I mean, in my own subject drama, it could be argued, some people have argued, and I won't get too sidetracked on this, but a lot of the developments in drama in the 70s and 80s, drama in education, lost touch a bit with, with, with the art form under the influence of sort of progressive thinking and, 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 and so on. So I've mentioned literature and, and dance. In fact, um, I think progressive ideas in education, 60s and 70s, which I subscribed to and had a you know of course I was brought up in really but there was a danger perhaps in a lot of the art subjects of losing touch with form you know when when we and technique when we emphasize free expression and creativity and so on in in, in the various arts so it's it's useful as a reminder of form but it's also useful I think 
this notion of art for art's sake, because it reminds us of the importance of words like entertainment and enjoyment in relation to the arts. Now, that seems like a fairly obvious thing to say that the arts are to do with entertainment. But I'm talking here about an education context where we know the arts aren't taken as seriously as we want them to be. We know that they're often seen as a frill. We know that they're often seen as, as, as less important than basic subjects, so-called and so on. So there's a tendency, I think, to avoid the um, words entertainment, enjoyment, and even amusement. Now, there's an American aesthetic writer called Schusterman, which some people in the audience may know because he, he writes a lot about uh, the importance of the body and, and movement and so on. But Schusterman contrasts the arts with, he says, the arts, he doesn't make the contrast himself, but he says the arts have been contrasted with idle pleasure seeking. So we want to think the arts are something really serious, which they are, of course, but there's that contrast. He says words don't have fixed meanings, and he's following Wittgenstein there. So if we substitute other words on the same sort of continuum, entertainment, if we use words like nourishment and sustaining and well-being and so on, as an extension of the not notion of, uh, of entertaining, uh, and, uh, of entertainment, then it's a worthwhile way of, 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 of thinking. And in an education context, I think the art for art's sake separatist notion is a reminder of the importance of those uh, dimensions. And I'm just going to read out what, just as Schusterman says, the self is sustained and strengthened by being freed from attention to itself. So he goes from entertainment to notions of sustaining and strengthening, and then the notion of being freed from attention to itself. So the ability to decenter is paradoxically, I think, quite often at the center of the arts. And I say paradoxically because the arts, you know, when you're engaged in an art form, it does seem to be as if it is about centering on the self. But I think the element of decentering arguably is central to a lot of engagement with the arts. And uh, I just want to pick up on that 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 point about decentering, which really brings us uh, to your question about uh, interculturalism. The question I'd like to uh, pose is, are there any risks in employing the arts to support the teaching of interculturalism, which in current circumstances is really a very hot topic? It's a very hot topic. And, <clears throat> and uh, you know, it's one of the areas that I became very interested in. And I think the answer has to do with the notion of overgeneralizing again, I suppose, leading to stereotyping. And I suspect, you know, people who are, are, are attending this will be familiar with those notions that there are dangers when you use a, an art subject or a, or a piece of art as representative as a, as a, a country or a people. Uh, there are dangers of reinforcing sort of stereotypical notions or create reinforcing the notion that something is different or exotic or even repellent. I mean, in the article, I draw on one or two writers who talk about the practice of enacting rituals in drama, which was very common, you know, um, in ways that really had no knowledge about the culture at all. They, would, they talk about another um, writer on visual art talks about making African masks and, and totems and so on without providing enough of, of, of the context. So there are some dangers there, which, you know, as long as a teacher is, is aware of them, can mitigate them by 
taken more critical and participatory um, approaches. So there's a similarity, I think, here with some of the very early intercultural training, where the training was all to do with do's and don'ts in a culture. You know, if you, if you, uh, if you go to this country, you, you, do you bring a gift when you go to somebody's house? And they were all little tips of do's and don'ts, which are harmless enough in themselves. But the teaching or the training in these courses was often to do with, you know, stereotyping the people and uh, universalizing the behavior so that gift giving, you know, was never seen as, as a, you know, a human act of generosity is always to do with status or, or something. There was always a, a cultural explanation that went away from the deep human act of, of generosity. And so it's like the lecturer who's told that a certain um, people are quiet and don't join in seminars might reinforce that and so on and 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 so on. So it's the danger of, of generalizing with regard to um, um, uh, other cultures that can lead to negative stereotyping unintentionally. I think that that's the risk. But what I want to what I want want to argue, however, is that the arts have a relevance to, to the theme of of interculturalism that isn't just to do with representing arts art forms from other cultures as representative of them. There are other ways that the arts are relevant to the notion of interculturalism. I hope that makes sense. It, it, it does make sense, but uh, perhaps it would be uh, helpful for our own thinking and contemplation if you can just explain a little bit more what, what you're meaning by that. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I'll come at it, if I may, in a slightly sort of indirect way. I mean, very at the start, I warned against overgeneralizing about the arts and forming a theory about the art. But I was careful, I hope, to say that doesn't mean we can't generalize. You know, we have to generalize, otherwise we, we can't communicate, we can't talk. And doesn't mean we should never say anything general about the arts, that we should only talk. No, we, we, we can still say broad general things about the arts. And I wanted to say something about the relationship of the notion of art to that of aesthetic, the aesthetic. But, and this is going to sound a bit contradictory, I think, but they're, they're terms that are both broad and narrow at the same time than each other. I'll, I'll, I'll explain what I mean. The aesthetic often refers to formal aspects of a work. We know that, notions of beauty and form and so on. Um, so that there's a sense in which it's quite a narrow aspect of art, the aesthetic, because it attaches to, you know, one uh, uh, notion. But it's also broader than the notion of art, because we have aesthetic experiences, some would argue, in relation to nature, sunsets, mountains and so on. So the art, though, is usually referred as a concept, it's retained for human, what hu intentional objects or performances made by human beings. It seems a very, very obvious thing to say. Actually, it seems really obvious. But I think it's quite an interesting notion because what you have in an encounter with art is an encounter, if you like, with humanity. We're, again, I turn to you know, Wittgenstein who says, when we look at art, we're recognizing the humanity of others, which is quite a thought provoking notion. So that in a very general sense, it's humanity coming together. Beyond that, art very much, I think, deals in particulars. And where I realize I've seemed to have gone quite away from uh, the 
theme of interculturalism, but where it relates has to do with notions of intercultural competence that go beyond talking about knowledge of other cultures um, or even understanding of other cultures, but go on to more um, attitudinal dimensions to do with decentering the attitude we take to difference, whether we have an inquiring, uh, open, receptive attitude to things that are different around us. And this is where I think art is really helpful or can be, I suppose we should say, depending on how it's, it, it, it's approached, in terms of helping people to have a generous, open, inquiring attitude to difference, which is, I think, interculturalism at a much deeper level than sort of tips and so on. So it's, it's the potential to develop a positive, inquiring, empathetic attitude to, to difference. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to go a little bit off script here, but it, it is sort of coming back to, to what we discussed earlier about this notion of uh, technique and emotion. Yes. And it's really drawing on uh, a conversation I had uh, early uh, today uh, with uh, an artist, a, a visual artist, and we were talking about um, the emotive responses one engages with when they're looking at some sort of art, art, an artifact, whether it's a dance work or whether it's a painting or whether it's a listening. And, and I said, the worst thing that could happen is that there is no emotive, <laughs> however well technically it's executed if it doesn't talk to that person then is that really serving is that artifact serving its purpose um i wonder if you've got any sorts of thoughts from either your own personal perspective about that 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 observation or something that uh any writers about the art as an aesthetic as an emotive uh engagement might have well, from, from, from a teaching perspective, I think the key notion is about balance. And I mentioned drama early on. I mean, in the 60s and, and, uh, and 70s, ideas associated with creativity, creative expression, free expression, an emotion, engagement and emotion came very much to the fore, I would say, and that was common in quite, 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 quite a lot of, of, of the arts. It's certainly the case um, in drama that built on um, dramatic play in modes and improvisation modes that was very exciting and children in schools found it very exciting. And there was certainly uh, a high level of emotional engagement, one you could, you could say. But critics, and there were severe critics, said that it was losing touch with the art form itself, notions of acting. You know, at one time in drama, in drama and education, notions of theatre and acting were sort of put to one side as being too artificial, you know, because we're interested in, 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 in expressive approaches um, here. So to me, it's, it's a question of balance and you can't say what that balance should look like out of context, I think. I mean, teaching is, is, is a very subtle process, I think. Anybody who says it isn't, either hasn't taught or has never really taken it seriously. It's constant judgment. You can't do it from a, a rule book, although a rule book will help at the start. It's constant judgment, balancing, weighing up. And it's very much about contextualizing. So it's it's quite hard to overgeneralize, or it's quite dangerous to overgeneralize about teaching. Yeah, I mean that's that's quite interesting because you know David Carr, who is an educational uh, philosopher, talks about 
you know, what is teaching? Is it a set of skills or is it a characteristic coming from the individual and sort of a, like Absolutely. a vocation? Absolutely. And I would, yes, I would sort of build on that a little bit to say the question, we, we could develop the question, what is teaching, to say, in what ways do we use the word teaching that either help us or limit us? We might inadvertently be using the word in a very narrow way, you know, that's cutting off possibilities. We can get trapped by language, which is a very Wittgenstein way of, of or deceived by language. Yes. Yeah, I think we've all been in uh, uh, situations where we've been in conversation with someone and we're just talking at cross purposes and it's not until 15 minutes later that it, the realisation is that neither of us are on the same page. And often we think it would all have worked out if only we defined our terms. Quite often academic papers and people, you know, students writing papers that we must start off with an exact definition, much like the theory of art. Actually, that's not the case, I think. You know, language isn't like that. Language doesn't work in boxes in that way. Language works through family resemblances, as Wittgenstein would say. So it's a question of feeling able to communicate with each other with language, but being aware of the limitations that language can exercise on us. I think um, particularly in dance and sticking to this idea of, of, of language terminology, yeah. one of the uh, which raises a, a wry smile is when we talk about uh, in dance, oh, this dancer or this student is so musical, has great musicality. And when I say, well, what do you mean by musicality? Uh, it, it is a little bit like, let's not get too bogged down in definitions, but a response is quite often, well, you know what I mean. So I think, you know, that this is really coming back to, to what you said. I mean, there are lots of different meanings and there is no right or wrong, but we need to be aware of it. Is that sort of a, a takeaway a, message? That's, that's a real takeaway. That's a great summary actually and it's a good example yes it, it, that the meanings are overlapping and if you it, it, you know if you listen to people arguing on television or something it often is an argument actually about the way people are seeing language without people realizing that that's the source of the argument <laughs> exactly look um mike we're, we're coming uh, towards the end of our time and i really do hope that our uh, our participants our listeners uh, are putting together some papers it, it is quite uh sometimes that you need to go away and think about it but um before we do open the floor to asking those questions and just to let everyone know, we will stop the uh, recording when we do have the question and answer session so that, you know, they feel free to, you know, have a flow of consciousness if, if you want. But um, could you just sum up for us the, 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 the key points, the takeaway points uh, of the discussion so far? Yes, yes, I can do that. And um, um, <clears throat> the first one I'd say has been probably implicit in what I've been saying rather than explicit. It's an implicit theme has to, been to promote a style of thinking that's not dogmatic and adversarial, choosing one theory over another. I'm talking about in an academic context here, but rather seeing what is valuable and helpful in different theoretical perspectives. That, so that's one takeaway. The second one comes from recognizing our craving for generality, which means not trying to outlaw generalization which would clearly be inappropriate, but rather to examine the consequences of how we use language. Is this generalization we're making actually taking us in the wrong direction? Um, I mentioned the interesting tactical issues uh, related to advocacy and the notion of overgeneralization, you know, that we can seem to be making too many claims for the arts. 
that's a tactical one. My primary interest, however, is in relation to teaching and the relationship of teaching to whatever value is claimed for the arts or the particular art forms. So if we say this is the value, do we make the link with the teaching? Or do we say because it's creative, imaginative activity or aesthetic experience, the claim automatically is valid. And so I think concepts, I didn't, I don't think I touched on this, so it's less of a summary, it's probably introduces something else, but I think concepts like creativity, imagination, and aesthetic experience, important as they are, can often be used as a kind of generalized smoothing over justification for whatever goes on without probing uh, beyond them, those notions. I suggested that notions of entertainment and enjoyment are relevant, but they don't have to be seen as the sole justification for the arts. We're not forced to choose. Um, and on, on the intercultural, I think that has very much to do with the particular and the, and the general. Um, it's fostering an awareness of the negative consequences of overgeneralizing and to seek and to develop a positive attitude to difference that the arts have a, a role in. And finally, one of the key questions that interests me is the simple question, what does it mean to teach art? Uh, you know, what does it actually mean in concrete terms in, in the classroom? That that's something worth reflecting on in relation to these uh, claims that we make in relation to the arts.